Evening, everyone. Welcome to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton. This is the home of positive populism, pro-worker, pro-family, pro-community, and especially pro-America. The deceitful duds in the White House outdid themselves this week with the sheer shamelessness of their cynicism and hypocrisy. Here's Harris on police reform. This work is long overdue. America has a long history of systemic racism. Yeah, it is long overdue, not least because last year you blocked it in the Senate for having Republican Senator Tim Scott's name on it instead of yours. And because there's no limit to Harris hypocrisy, she blocked it with the Senate filibuster, which we're now told is a racist relic of Jim Crow, except when Kamala Harris uses it to kill police reform, in which case the filibuster is an ally of equity or something. Not to be outdone, the other bumbling half of the Biden-Harris administration, as we're instructed to call it, spoke movingly about the pain caused by racism. Profound fear and trauma, the pain, the exhaustion, and black and brown Americans experience every single day. And to be fair, as Kamala Harris herself pointed out in the Democratic primary, if anyone should really know about the fear and trauma and pain and exhaustion black and brown Americans experience, it is Joe Biden, the architect of the 1994 crime bill, which destroyed countless black families and communities. Yeah, Joe Biden, the legendary anti-racism campaigner who for decades has modeled the kind of respectful dialogues we need to heal our racial wounds. You cannot go to a 7-Eleven or a Dunkin' Donuts unless you have a slight Indian accent. It's a fully, I'm not joking. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. If you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. I mean, you got the first sort of mainstream African-American yeah. who is articulate and bright and, and, and clean and a nice-looking guy. I wonder what changed for Joe Biden. Perhaps he did finally meet some clean black people. Who knows? Anyway, the real point Biden wanted to make was not how anti-racist he now is, but how irredeemably racist you all are. It was a murder in the full light of day, and it ripped the blinders off for the whole world to see the systemic racism. The Systemic racism. We hear a lot about that from the Democrats these days. Some conservatives dismiss the whole idea. There's no systemic racism, they say, just individual instances of racist behavior. And in fact, we're seeing less of that, not more. America's becoming less racist all the time and is the least racist nation on earth. I agree with much of that. And of course, we should all work to keep our racial progress going. But actually, if you take the term systemic racism literally, I do think there's something to it. I just don't think if I were the Democrats, that I'd put it front and center of my political case, because if you want to see a system that really does produce racial injustice, that really does undermine the ideal of equal opportunity for every American, regardless of race, it's a system that is overwhelmingly controlled by Democrats. The biggest, most widespread, and most destructive example of systemic racism in this country is the public school system, in places with the highest concentration of black pupils, places like California, where there's the equivalent of a four-year achievement gap between black and white eighth grade students, places like Seattle, where the education gap is so embarrassingly wide, they've stopped reporting the data, places like New York City, where two-thirds of white students in grades three through eight are proficient in math, compared to just 36 percent of their black peers, and places like Washington, D.C., where less than a third of black students are even literate. Of course, this is all devastating in its own right for those kids in those schools now. But beyond that, it'll have a devastating impact for the rest of their lives. Success in high school is not only tied to college graduation rates, but lifetime earnings and criminal behavior as well. Studies have even shown a connection between educational attainment and health. Much was made of the higher coronavirus death rate among black Americans, and rightly so, it was a horrible aspect of the pandemic. But that didn't happen because the virus is racist. It's because black people in this country are, on average, on the wrong side of the education and income gap, and that leads to worse health outcomes. So even that goes back to school. 
Why do black kids have so much worse outcomes in schools run by Democrats? Because those schools, like the ones in New York City, are often places with poor attendance enforcement, less rigorous teaching, and more time spent on anti-academic, wokist distractions like critical race theory. They are the public schools totally controlled by the teachers' unions, who, of course, totally control the Democrats with their donations and activism. They've given over $86 million to the Democratic Party since 1990, more than 24 times the amount given to Republicans. And the facts are clear. Schools that are free of teacher union control in the same places with just as high proportions of black kids have totally different outcomes. Students from LA charter schools are far more likely to be eligible for state universities than their peers in union-run schools. Seattle charter school students gained the equivalent of between 30 and nearly 60 more days of learning in New York City, even when charter school classes are in the same buildings as union-run classes, the kids in charter school did better. So yes, there is systemic racism in this country, but it's not Democrats fighting it, it's Democrats doing it with their corrupt embrace of the teacher unions. And yes, there's a solution to this kind of systemic racism, but it's not the Democrats' woke madness and wasteful spending, it's conservative ideas like school choice and parent power. Since the pandemic, there's a new energy behind the school choice movement. Just in the last year, we've seen bills at the state and national level pushing to give parents more options, echoing our My School Money Back campaign from last summer. It's happening because Republican lawmakers have been advocating for it. And we need the same kind of change now in places where Democrats have been in charge. But there's something else we need that's even more foundational, and we touched on it last week. At the heart of so many issues we talk about is family and parenting, yet it's barely mentioned in our political debates. That has to change. As I always say, none of us is a perfect parent in a position to lecture anyone else. But we can help parents, coach parents, set expectations for parents, so we try and make sure every child is raised in a stable, loving home. School choice, yes. Police reform, yes. But more important than all of that, is the reconstruction of the American family. That's the next revolution we need.